One extra. Tiffany Calver, One Extra Rap Show. And today is a very special day because I'm, first of all, we're in Jungle City with the Louis Vuitton wallpaper, which is absolutely <laughs> mad. Um, a very prolific studio. Yeah, uh, mad hits is made in this room. You know what I mean? So many. Um, so it's an honor to be sat here, of course, with one of, not only in my opinion, but also everyone that counts. One of the greatest hip hop producers Thank you. of all time. Thank you. That's a uh, big Swiss that's Swiss. a big title <laughs> introduction. Of course, we're in this incredible studio right now. Um, but I want you to kind of describe to me what the room looked like where you made your first beat. Um ten times smaller than the room we're in now. <laughs> yeah. Um and it was less equipment, you know. Less was definitely more. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I still I'm still like that now. Like this is not my favorite room in the studio. My favorite room is the smaller room because I don't know. It's just something about being intimate mm -hmm. and being able to mess up. Yeah. Right. Like if, like this room, it could fill up like a, with lots of people, and it just naturally attracts lots of people. Mm -hmm. But when I'm in a small room, you kind of know not to come in, or if you come in, not to stay. Yeah. And so I don't know, like, I just feel like um, I always want to feel like I'm up to something. I heard that Rough Riders Anthem was the first beat that you made. Stop, drop, shut them down, open up shop. No, um, I th it was, no. Okay, good. <laughs> so it'd be like, that, that would be absolutely nuts. No, because a lot of people don't understand is, um, or remember mm. that Although my family's Rough Rider and, you know, my dad's father, my dad's uncles, I mean, my dad's brothers, which are my uncles, yeah. started Rough Riders. Um, it's a family business. Yeah. But I had to go outside the family first mm. to kind of really be accepted in the family because I was so close. Okay. And so they knew me as a DJ and I was already doing my DJing thing, but mm. as being a producer, that wasn't my main title, so I had to really fight for it. So I produced... Um, uh, band from TV with Noriega before that. Okay. Um, Flip Mode Squad album with Buster. Tear the roof off. A lot of hits and then. Yeah, I was gonna say it, these are still it, hits. It, it, it teed <laughs> off. It teed off to Stop Drop, which um, which kind of like put my stamp in the ground. Like, oh, okay, this is this this guy is different. When you, when you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. Yeah. Right. So I've been doing what I've loved since before Rough Riders Anthem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So since you were like 16, like young. Even before that, I was doing what I was what I, what I love because I was DJing before that. Yeah. What, when did you start DJing? Probably like professionally, like 12. What? Yeah. 12? Yeah, in the clubs. No, <laughs> in the clubs? Yeah, they, they used to call me the youngest in charge. How would you, yeah, I mean, yeah. But um, <laughs> how would you, okay, how as a 12 year old are you getting into said clubs to DJ? Well, it started from my mixtapes and... Sorry, what? <laughs> At yeah. 12? Yeah, I was cutting hair in a barbershop, selling mixtapes. I was already hustling. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, having fun just figuring out ways to buy records, figuring out ways to just um, yeah. get people excited. I always like to see people excited. Yeah. You know, um, which is why I picked DJing over rapping uh, way early because I would go to the back, in the back park in mm. the Bronx where I grew up at and... There be guys rapping, Karis one, this one, that one, but the DJ just felt special to me because he really controlled the crowd, mm. and I was like, "Wow, I like that right there. Whatever that is, yeah. that's what I want to do." Yeah. Um, and it and it and it went into me making records, yeah. which is why I can make anthem choruses and the ad libs and those that, that come from DJing, mm. right? So I contribute like a lot of my DJing to my to my producing. <laughs> I got a million ways to get it. On to the next one was such a massive hit. I remember being in like dance club at school. And like mm -hmm. we made a dance routine to it. I can uh, probably remember it, but I'm not <laughs> going to do it. Damn. Um, again, I think you've always had such an incredible working relationship with Jay-Z. Yeah. Um, what was the first record you guys made together? Um, we made like six records together for the first time. Mm -hmm. When the first time. Um, that was on um, Hard Knock Life. We started on Hard Knock Life. So we had like, Fun. If I Should Die, um, Money Cash, yeah. Coming to Age 2, 
All of those records were done at like the same week That's right. that he met me. What? Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys just hit it off? Yeah, I mean, he was looking for other producers that was in the Rough Rider camp. And okay. then um, my uncle had a good relationship with him. He was like, you should, you should meet my nephew as well. Yeah. And then, you know, to him spitting verses to, oh, to me over the phone two days ago. Yeah. Since 17. <laughs> Yeah, it's been been a long ass time. A really long time. <laughs> and of course, I'm from London. Gigs. Yeah. Come again. It's madness. Madness, <laughs> madness. Yeah. But yeah. how did how did Swiss Beats meet Gigs? Um, I I met Gigs through actually Angel. Oh wow, the singer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's random. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cause I was working with Angel a lot. Like, you know, I helped him yeah. with his deals and certain things. Um, although I didn't sign him to me personally, I felt like he already was talented enough to fly his own his own way. Yeah. But I, I made a couple of phone calls for him and, and we were, you know, super cool actually. Super talented uh guy. And I I I was like Excited to meet Gaze because he reminded me of DMX. Mm. Like his tone, mm. the kind of villain. Yeah, I see that. The you landlord. Know, yeah, the landlord, <laughs> his demeanor. And then we ended up kicking in and becoming like super good friends, like even beyond, like way, like we, we really don't even talk about music. Yeah. Right, it's like real things and, and, and trading information mm. as far as like how to get to the next level and, 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 and do you know you know coming from where we come from it's like how do you navigate the waters mm. right when you when you when you come from the badlands but it's like the the the, the treasure is right there mm. right and so you know we have, we have a great chemistry yeah you know just went out there and, and we just did um, shot his uh, terminator video <laughs> yes. which we had like super fun yeah we're in the middle of nowhere <laughs> <laughs> like three hours outside of city i mean like wow yeah i love the fact that i feel like your son has kind of like inherited just so like all of you especially you saying you're starting at like 12. how old is he yeah egypt is eight now eight yeah yeah absolutely mad just yeah but he beat me he you know producing kendrick at five yeah what took the cake i I didn't even produce Kendrick, but i'm about to but i haven't yet (laughs) <laughs> did it not? Did it naturally come? Did he naturally just want to get yeah, stuck I in mean, and learn? It wasn't even about music. It was just about their connection. Like mm. Egypt wasn't even listening to Kendrick. He didn't even know that was Kendrick. <laughs> they just had like a kindred spirit with each other and connected at the Super Bowl, and that's, that it just happened. He he wanted to go. Egypt never wanted to come to the studio. Mm. We're always in the studio. He wanted he wanted to be a kid. Yeah. Um, but he woke up and was like, I want to make a track for my friend Kendrick. I'm like, oh, your friend, do you know your friend Kendrick is very serious? <laughs> <laughs> and um, he started like humming the melodies and went and wrote the chords. You know, he was already um, playing piano by that time. So I recorded the whole thing just so people wouldn't think that I made. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have. He wouldn't even let me correct him. Like he's that. Like no, Dad, I got it. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, I sent the tracks to Kendrick just for fun. Yeah, yeah. And then um, he didn't respond back, and I was just like, okay, cool. Yeah. And his manager called me like 30 minutes after, like, Swiss, did your son make that for real? I was like. Yeah, he was like, oh, damn. I'm going to call you back. Oh right? He got out of the phone. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> and he called back and says, like, does he even have, like, a publishing company set up or anything like that? I was like, no, why? He, was... <laughs> he sent four tracks. Yeah. I was like, no, why? He was like, he just made my job hard. I got to replace a song. Oh, wow. I was like, hold up. <laughs> Kendrick is using that? He was like, Yes. I was happy and jealous at the same time. <laughs> like, how you happy? How you jealous of your five year old son? I was like, shit. No, it was a, it was a great moment. I think um, to last in this industry, one your intentions have to be right, 
right? Like a lot of people get involved in music and creativity for like um, for like the wrong reasons, like the materialistic reasons yeah. that come and go, you know. Um, but if it's like your passion and this is what you do, your integrity is is going to equal your longevity as well because sometimes you're going to have to say no. Mm. Like big no's, <laughs> right? Like like the, the, the the big yes turns into the big no. And you have to know when to say, you say the big no. Even though it might get you more money, it might get you more this. Everything, you have to have a plan. Like, you know, when you first get into it, it's like you feel up because it's like more than what you just had. And the business know that already, right? So the business know that you just came from the hood and they offering you 100,000, a million, whatever the number is. It's more than what you just had. So in your mind, like, shoot, I'm going to take this money. I don't care what I'm going to sign. I don't care what I'm going to do because yeah. I need to get to the next level. That's okay. You're going to have some skin in the game to get to the next level, but you have to know when to put your own skin in the game now, right? When to say no to a, a contract or something that you signed when you was 17, 18 now you 30 and you're still doing the same things, right? Because it's an easy thing to do. And it's just like, man, you're putting in like all this time and you still have the same mentality, the same deal, the same everything you've chasing since you was 18, 17. That's an imbalance, right? And, you know, you just have to adjust yourself as your success happens, as your time progresses, because, you know, those people are not going to call you, right? Like when it's up, everybody's going to call you. When you when it's down, people are gonna find the best excuse not to. Oh, I didn't want to bother you. Oh, this. Oh, that. Oh, that. Yeah, yeah, right. So you have to have your plan and just know that um, you just can't believe what people say you are. You have to know who you are. So that's what I would say. Love that. Yeah. Um, and before we go, what's next for Swiss Beats? Um, the sky's not the limits. It's just the view. Jeez. Okay, and we'll end it there. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, yes. If you enjoyed this, like and subscribe and click the bell icon to keep up to date. For more great audio and video from the BBC, listen on Sounds, watch on iPlayer.